problems uh, are in some way concerned with stress and the languages where stress stress plays a role and the in these problems they are quite different they come from different regions of the world so we can see there is a problem on on an on a pair of extinct languages Tocharan A and Tocharan B uh, there is a problem on Pirahan uh, there is a problem on Greek uh, so from so all kinds of languages where stress plays a role uh, so once again so stress is prominence given to a certain syllable or to certain syllables in a word so which means that some syllable is in some way highlighted uh, is made more important than others or whatever you may call it uh, what i'm going to talk about today is not uh, not phonetics so i'm going to talk about phonology so what is prominence phonetically uh, never mind or at least uh, we are not going to talk about it today it, it may be different kinds of things it may be vowel length it may be vowel quality it may be something in the something linked to the uh, tone uh, pitch or whatever it is but uh, we're going only to speak about how the stressed syllable is determined in the languages of the world and what are the constraints that are put on stress uh, in the languages of the world. So, if we speak of stress mathematically, what is stress? Stress is a function that associates a number to every word of a language. For instance, if we have a set of English words, I only take uh, words like, uh, I only take uh, words from, the, from this sentence I have here above, and I uh, ignore functional words like a eh or is or of but I take all other words and here you see there is a set of uh, words uh, and there is a set of numbers numbers that uh, indicate which syllable is stressed for instance in a word speaking the first syllable is stressed so uh, so and so it is in the word function and so it is in the word stress and in the word associates the second syllable is stressed in the word mathematically the third syllable is stressed and so forth and you see that there is a correspondence between the items in the first set between english words and uh, the items in the second set between numbers uh, as you can see i use here positive numbers positive integer numbers one two three and so forth well no more numbers were needed for these examples but uh, it implies that i can't stress from the left uh, from the beginning of the word this is not necessarily the case i could also count stress from the end of the word uh, and in this case i would map the uh, words onto a set of uh, negative numbers just for convenience for the for convenience sake i use positive numbers to count from the beginning and negative numbers to count from the end those of you who are into programming might know that this is the notation that is used in some programming languages most notably python uh, more or less uh, and here you see that speaking has the stress on the second syllable from the end stress has stress on the first syllable from the end function has stress on the second syllable from the end associates has stress on the third syllable from the end uh, mathematically has stress on the fourth syllable from the end and so forth and this uh, uh, so this this understanding of stress as functions that mm, associates a number to every word leads us to a question uh, how does this function work in different languages what i'm going to ignore today is pitch accent it, uh, it means that uh, in some languages there are different kinds of accent uh, it is possible that stress not only falls on the third syllable uh, from the end but it can be also of different types it can be rising or falling or whatever uh, but i'm going to ignore this now and uh, what i'm going to ignore is also the distinction between primary stress and secondary stresses uh, so between the main stress and weaker stresses i'm going to talk only about primary stress so i uh, i'm going to say that uh, each word has a number attached to it so a number that indicates the number of stressed syllable and we're going to talk about how this function 
works in different languages. Uh, first of all, let's determine the range of possible values for, uh, for a language. In Portuguese, as you well know, stress can fall on any of the three last syllables of a word. So in, in our notation, it is minus three, minus two, and minus one. So stress cannot fall on the fifth syllable from the end, or something, something like that. And uh, this is uh, quite an important restriction, restriction and not all uh, languages of the world have this kind of restrictions. For instance, in Russian, stress is not restricted so it is only restricted by the length of the world of the word if you take a word like uh, to the one that has crystallized uh, this is a participle that's why it's so long uh, well russian words are not normally that long but uh, it is an extreme case of course but you see that it, this word has an has stress on the first syllable so it's ninth syllable from the end negative nine you see here and it's a uh, very uh it's a very it's uh, it's very uncommon but it is still possible to have stress on the ninth or on the eighth or on the seventh syllable from, from the end in russian on the other hand uh if if you count from the beginning you know word like it is also a participle also very long the one having her characterized you see it's seventh syllable from the beginning so it's second syllable from the end, but nothing restricts Russian stress from falling on the seventh syllable from the beginning of the of a word. So this is an example of really unrestricted range of possible values for stress. But there are languages where the where word stress is even more restricted than in Portuguese and obviously more restricted than in Russian. Because in many languages, there is only one possible value for stress placement. And we call such languages languages with fixed stress. So fixed, which means it is attached to a certain syllable of a word, and this stress is very easy to is very easy to determine. So it is uh, it is uh, it is uh, some it is uh, some uh, syllable from the beginning of the word or from the end of the word. And let's have a look at the languages of the world that have this pattern. So let's start with a language that you are probably familiar with to some extent. It's French. In French, you have some uh, examples of words. Uh, souvent, which means often. Parler, which means to speak. Château, which means fortress. Attention, which means attention. Reviendra, which means she will return. Participant, which means participant. And you see that in all these words, uh, stress falls on the last syllable. In my transcriptions, I will uh, mark stress with this uh, with this uh, with this uh, mark before the stress syllables. So in souvent, you see uh, two syllables, sou and van, and uh, the stress syllable van is marked uh, with a line in front of it, to the left of it. So, souvent parler, château, attention, reviendra, participant. So, uh, six words illustrate that in French, stress normally falls on the last syllable of a word. Uh, and mm, in our notation, it, it would be minus one, and it is a very common pattern. So, there are 10% of the languages of the world where stress falls on the last syllable. Well-known examples are French, uh, Turkic languages, Guarani language is also an example of uh, language with a stress in the final syllable. And uh, uh, not surprisingly, in many languages with uh, that use the Roman alphabet, stress is marked in uh, the name of the Guarani language. So, And if you look at these languages on a map, you see that, uh, this la that these languages, uh, that these languages are distributed across the world in a pattern like this. This is the map from the World Atlas of Language Structures, waltz.info. Uh, and you see that uh, these languages are quite numerous in South America. They are also quite numerous in Southeast Asia and in Papua New Guinea. Uh, you see that French 
is not marked in this map as a language with uh, final stress. If it were there, it would, there would be a dot uh, located uh, where Paris is. We'll discuss uh, later on why this is the case, why, why French is not marked as such a language, but uh, you see that uh, you see that uh, these languages are actually quite numerous. So, approximately 10% of the languages of the world. This uh, is a sample, but still. Uh, another example I'm going to show you today is Czech, uh, the language of the International Linguistics Olympiad that was held in 2018. Uh, you see Ruka and Ananas, pineapple, abeceda, kultura, discoteca. Uh, these words all have stress in the first syllable. Uh, in the word uh, discoteca, there is also a long e, uh, which is uh, marked by uh, and by a diacritic sign, but the stress is still on the first syllable. So Czech is an example of a language where stress always falls on the first syllable. And this is an even more common pattern. It is approximately 18% of the languages of the world. So there are some well-known examples, mostly in Europe, uh, Czech, Slovak, Finnish, Estonian, Icelandic. And if you look at the map uh, of the world, you see that this pattern is actually quite common for Europe. It is also quite common for Australia. And uh, there are some there are some examples of this pattern in, uh, in Latin America, too. Uh, so this is stressed in the first syllable of the word. Uh, let's have a look at language number three, Polish. Wodze is chief, tramwaj is tram, zobaczyć is to see, doktor is doctor, doktora is of the doctor, genitive singular, Doktorowi is to the doctor, dative singular case. And the pattern is really obvious here too. It is second syllable from the end of the word, or uh, as linguists say, the, penult the penultimate syllable, minus two in our notation. And this pattern is even more common. It accounts for 22% of the languages of the world. Uh, some well-known examples include Polish, Swahili, Hawaiian, uh, and this is the map. And you see that it is very common in Papua New Guinea. And there are also some like, languages of the kind in South America too. Uh, one more example is uh, Onyati Basque language. Uh, uh, it is a dialect of Basque spoken in Onyati, a uh, place in the, in the, in the, in the, it is a small place in Spain, uh, Laguna. Uh, to the, fr the friend, Katueri to the cats, Menditara to the mountains, Lendakaisha, the president, and it is fairly obvious that what we have here is stress on the, on the second syllable counting from the beginning of the word. Uh, this is a quite uncommon pattern. Only three languages, or three percent of the language, three percent of the languages of the world have this pattern. The well, some well-known examples include. Basque, uh, several dialects of it, and Lakota in North America. You see they are mm, here on the map too. And one more language with fixed stress is Macedonian. It is a language co uh, mm, spoken in the Bal Balkan Peninsula uh, in Europe. And you see Jena, wife, vide, she sees, Besede, lecture, Vodenicer, miller, the senator, the lecture with definite article, which is suffixed in this language, ta besedata vodenichari millers, and vodenicharite with a suffixed definite article te. It uh, differentiates, it has different forms for singular and plural and for different uh, genders in the singular. And uh, you see vodenicharite, the millers, all these words have stress on the third syllable from the end what is called antepenultimate syllable. Uh, so the stress on the antepenult, minus three in our notation, is even uh, less common. It is 2% of the languages of the world. And here is the map of these languages, also taken from the World Atlas of Language Structures. Uh, one more thing I have to say here is that 
Uh, if you look at these words, you see that in words like Jena or, or Vide, there is no third syllable from the end. So it is kind of generalization uh, that uh, says that if there are less than two syllables, then stress falls, uh, if there are less than three syllables, then stress falls on a syllable that would be closest to the third syllable from the end. So uh, if we take a word like Jena, uh, then just imagine that there is a third, uh, that there is one more syllable at the beginning. Stress would fall on this syllable, but because this syllable is absent, then it shifts to je. Uh, so it makes our description more uh, concise because we don't need to say that stress falls on the third syllable from the end, but if there are only two syllables, it falls on the second syllable from the end, and if there is only one syllable, it falls on the only syllable. So just saying third syllable from the end will also include shorter words, meaning that in these cases, stress falls on the first syllable from the beginning. And similarly, if we say that stress falls on the second syllable from the beginning, then if there is only one syllable, stress obviously falls on this syllable. This is one observation. Another observation is that stress can play important an important role in morphology. You see that in these words, like vodenichar, vodenichar, vodenicharite, Stress differentiates between uh, forms, number forms, and forms with or without a definite article. Uh, similarly, in Polish, you have uh, you have doktor, doktora, doktorowi, uh, where stress differentiates between different case forms. So, uh, nominative, genitive, and uh, dative have different stresses, and this is what fixed stress allows us to do. Fixed stress makes it possible to have some interesting stress patterns in morphology, because uh, if it is stressed, but words have different, if the stress is fixed, but words have different length, we have quite different uh, stress patterns in a paradigm and, of a word. So form the word can have different stress. And uh, here you see the map where all these stress patterns are illustrated. Uh, red shapes are the ones where stress is, count, is uh, countered from the left, from the beginning of the word, and the blue forms are, uh, the blue shapes are the ones, where, are the languages where stress is uh, countered from the right, from the edge of the word, from the end. You see that in Europe, you mostly have uh, red, in Northern Europe, you mostly have red circles, and. Uh, Southern Europe, uh, if you move south, you have some blue circles, uh, some blue shapes too, and in Brazil it is mostly uh, blue shapes. So uh, it is mostly uh, stress countered from the end of a word. Uh, but now let's move to more interesting cases, uh, to the cases where stress is something more than just a first syllable of a word or second syllable of a word uh, and so forth. Uh, Let's have a look at Chuvash language. It is one of, one of the languages in Russia. In Russia, there are uh, many languages, just like in Brazil, approximately uh, 150 languages. Most of them are not so well known even to those who live in Russia, because if you ask a Russian person how many languages are there in Russia, well, uh, this person would uh, probably be Russian speaking, and uh, he or she would say, well, Russian and, mm, I don't know, Tatar, uh, and that's it. Unfortunately, uh, Russian people in Russia are, to a large extent, unaware of language diversity of Russia, but still there are 150 languages, and I will, I, I will show you three of these languages today, three of these languages belonging to different language families, and uh, th these languages have different stress patterns. So I'm going to start with Chuvash, which is one of the Turkic languages of Russia. And here are some examples, some words in Chuvash, and uh, you see that there is stress mark in these, in these words. Let me read them aloud. Yushek, Vishmine, Nushalantar, Veltrentari, Asarhanulla, Ilertul, Pitranchek, you see that there are some uh, strange vowels here, 
a with a diacritic sign and r with a diacritic sign above it uh, with an with a small arc this sign is called breve uh, it is a sign that indicates that these vowels are short so they are uh, very short reduced vowels a and e with this breve sign above they are um, produced short vowels they're pronounced shorter than ordinary a and e so in a word like Veltrentari, you see that the second e is longer than the first e because it is uh, it is a full vowel and the first vowel is a short one now let's look at the stress uh, patterns in these words. You see that in many cases, if we start looking at this list from the beginning, in many cases, stress falls on the last vowel of a word. And when does stress not fall on the last vowel of a word? Well, obviously, it is the case uh, when the last vowel of a word is a short one. So where the last vowel of a word bears this this diacritic mark above it, uh, you see asarhanul, 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 ilertul, pitrancek, asan, pelletle. In all these cases, the last vowel of a word is short, and stress does not fall on this vowel. Where and where does it fall? Well, obviously, it falls on the syllable that is closest to the end of the word but uh, that does not contain a short vowel on a syllable that contains a normal vowel and is closest to the end of the word of the word so we see in the case of peter and check this syllable that is closest to the end of the word is actually for the fourth syllable from the end but still the last syllable and the penultimate syllable and the antepenultimate syllable, uh, so minus one, minus two, and minus three, they are all short, they all contain short vowels, so we look for the, we look for a normal vowel and we find it in the first syllable, the fourth syllable from the end. And what happens in words where there is no normal vowel, no full vowel? In these cases, the stress falls on the first syllable. Asan and Pelletle are the examples of this pattern. So the rule is that stress falls on the last full vowel, if there is one. Uh, if there are no full vowels, stress falls on the first syllable. This, this is how stress in Chuvash operates. And uh, what we encounter here is the notion of weight. Uh, stress can be weight sensitive. So stress can uh, take into account some features of vowels or syllables that we call weight. What does it mean? It means that vowels or syllables are divided in two classes and the stress function operates on the sequence of these class labels. So if we say that these two classes are full and short for Chuvash, we say that the st stress for Viltrentari is a function uh, that operates on a sequence short, full, short, full. And in this for this sequence, it returns four. And for a sequence uh, like full, short, 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 um, as we have in Peter and Czech, this f function returns one and so forth. Uh, so, and if we look at this map, this map from the World Atlas of Language Structures shows languages that have uh, weight sensitive uh, stress. Uh, don't, go I'm not going into details uh, about uh, what. Uh, what different colors and different shapes here mean, but just uh, have a look at the colored shapes and at non at, at white circles. White circles are languages without uh, weight sensitive stress, are languages with fixed stress, and the colored uh, shapes are mostly weight sensitive, uh, uh, excluding 5% of the languages where, st where stress is not predictable. But you see that in this map, there are 55% of languages with fixed stress, uh, white circles, 40% of languages with uh, weight sensitive stress, and 5% of languages with not predictable stress. These not predictable stresses are purple circles. You see that they are quite uh, few in number. So 55% of the languages of the world are have fixed stress, uh, 
40% of the languages of the world have weight sensitive stress and 5% uh, have not predictable stress. So mostly fixed stress, but weight sensitive, sensitive stress is also an important pattern. And now let's have a look at the combinatorics of this weight sensitive stress. So vowels or syllables uh, are, are divided in two classes. And these classes are usually called H and L, heavy and light. Heavy syllables and light syllables, heavy vowels, light vowels. Well, normally we speak of syllables. And uh, we need rules to select one syllable in any sequence of H's and L's. So we need some kind of rules to select syllable in any given, in any given sequence of H's and L's. And let's look at it from the point of view of combinatorics. So uh, let's look at words with two syllables, three syllables, and four syllables. Uh, in words of two syllables, we can obviously have four combinations of H and L. This is what we have here, H, 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 L, L, H, and L, L. In words of three syllables, we can have eight combinations. In word of four syllables, we can have uh, 16 combinations. And now let's have a look at Chuvash stress pattern. In Chuvash, we select the uh, stressed syllable uh, following this uh, following this rule that the last heavy is stressed uh, or the first light if there are no heavies. So you see that in these cases, this, this is what the coloring would look like for Chuvash. So, uh, in these, you have 26, uh, you have 28 words, 28 word types, and for each word type, there is a highlighted syllable, the most prominent one, the stressed one. And it is how it is selected, so we know the rule, we know how this function operates that selects the stressed syllable, and uh, that's, uh, that's it for Chuvash. But now let's think of it from the mathematical point of view. So we have 28 words, 28 word types. We ignore words with one syllable because obviously these words, uh, stress falls in the first syllable. We also ignore longer words, words of five syllables or more because they're not so frequent in the languages of the world. But now let's think of it uh, as a problem in combinatorics. Uh, so what are the rules can we invent? Uh, for instance, what about a language that places stress like this. First syllable in H, H and heavy, heavy. Second syllable in heavy, light. First syllable in light, heavy. First syllable in light, heavy. Third syllable in heavy, 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 and so forth. Well, there are no rules that can be formulated shortly for, the, for this language. Such a language, in such a language, you would just need to memorize all these 28 uh, word types and to put stress accordingly. Just learn it by heart and nothing more. Uh, and if we think of it as a combinatorial problem, uh, what is the number of possible colorings of the previous slide? So what is the number of possible colorings where we select one uh, letter in each of these 28 sequences? Well, the answer is that it is two to the fourth because in all four word types are of having two syllables, we can place stress on any of the two syllables. It is three to the, multiplied by three to the eighth, because in all eight types uh, of three syllable words, we can place stress on any of uh, the syllables. And multiplied by four to the sixteenth, uh, four to the second to the fourth, because in any of these 16 words, we can place a stress on any of the four syllables. It is 450 trillion possibilities. 450 trillion. Uh, well, this is immense. This is an immense number. And uh, what we can try to do is to somehow restrict this, these possibilities. Because uh, we see that it is um, too, too many possibilities. We need some kinds of restrictions. And linguistics is actually some kind of restriction restrictions on combinatorics. So there are so many combinatorial possibilities and linguistics tells us what is possible and what is not. We would like to have some 
a way of saying that out of these 450 trillion possibilities, only some 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or whatever is possible. Now let's search for these restrictions. Uh, so first restrictions that we have is that if there is at least one H, at least one heavy syllable, stress cannot fall on light, on a light syllable. Uh, and this gives us stress in the words where it is highlighted in red. And this also gives us possible options, the green ones in the words where it is highlighted in, in, in the rest of the words. So where there are, in a word like heavy, light, heavy, stress cannot fall on light, stress uh, selects one of the heavies. In a word like heavy, light, light, stress uh, strictly falls on heavy. That's how it works in the languages of the world. And this is a very significant restriction because if we count the number of possibilities after this restriction has applied, it is two multiplied by two multiplied by three and so forth. It is only some 24 million of possibilities, which is much better than 450 trillion. So if you look at these, uh, at these words, we multiply two for HH by two for LL by three for HHH by two for HHL and so forth. And it is 24 million uh, possibilities, which is much better than 450 trillion. Uh, but now, uh, Let's return to our first example, to French. French was not marked as a language with fixed stress on the map from the World Atlas of Language Structures. Why is it the case? Because in French, you can analyze consonant final words as words ending in a vowel. Because if you look at French words like this, participant, parler, parle, performance, it has fixed stress on the last syllable. But if you look at the words, parle and performance as words with having a final vowel, a, a weak one, a schwa vowel, which can be pronounced in some circumstances, for instance, when, for instance, in poetry, in classical French poetry, it plays a role. And if you look at these words like this, participant, parler, parle, performance, then French is a weight-sensitive language. In this case, uh, you see that in French, the general rule is to stress the last heavy syllable, the last syllable containing a full vowel, or we don't know which syllable in a sequence of light uh, of light syllables because we don't have syllables, we don't have words that only have schwa vowels in French, they only have a sequence of schwas, and then what would happen then, we don't know. But uh, if we analyze French as a weight-sensitive language, it would be a language that has stress on the last of heavy vowels, on the last of full vowels, where schwa is a, this schwa vowel is a light one and all the rest are heavy. So this is how it works. But now let's have a look at more uh, complex uh, cases. Uh, one more language of Russia, Moksha, is an Uralic, an Uralic language. It is spoken also in the European part of Russia. Uh, and here are some words in Moksha. You see, Puvendams, Kuliti, Ramasak, Noldasak, Kelaska, Saradan, Targadat, Tushandat, Tutane, Putat, Mishandan uh, are the examples of Moksha words. Well, if it were a problem assigned to you at a linguistic Olympiad, it would be probably it would probably be a quite hard, quite a hard one because to disentangle the pattern, stress patterns in a language like this is not really easy, but let's have a look at it. Well, you see that uh, stress often falls on the first syllable. When does it not fall on the first syllable? In a language like Turgadat, in a word like Turgadat, you see that it is on the second syllable and the first syllable is a schwa. So it is probably some, so probably some weight is uh, plays a role here. Schwa is probably a light vowel, and A is probably a heavy vowel. So if we look at this word, we see that probably stress has to do has something to do with weight. And if you look at the next word, tushandat, you see that uh, it, stress doesn't even fall on the second syllable falls on the third syllable. And once again, you see a schwa vowel, an a vowel, and a 
an U vowel in the first syllable. What does it mean? Well, probably U is also a light vowel and A is a heavy one. And then we would say that stress falls on the first of the on the first heavy vowel in a word. In a, so the first heavy vowel in a word is uh, A in both these cases. Then, so if you proceed further looking at these cases, you can split the vowels in two classes. One of them is A, E, E, and O. And the second uh, class includes U, E, and Schwa vowels. So the first class is uh, heavy. This is A, E, E, and O. The second class is light, E, U, and E. And if you look at these words, you see that the rule is very simple. Stress the first of the vowels from the heavy set. And if there are no vowels from this set, then stress the first vowel, the first light vowel. So in a word like kuliti, in that ash, you see all vowels belong to the light set. And the first of them is stressed. In a word like puvendams, the same rule applies. In a word like ramasak, you buy it. The same rule applies, stress the first vowel, because all the because all the uh, vowels are heavy, Noldasak, all the vowels are heavy, and in a case like Mishandan, the first vowel is light, the second vowel is light, and the third one is heavy, so stress the third one. So you see that uh, the rule is simple as that. Uh, stress the first vowel from the heavy set, and if there are no vowels from this set, then stress the first light vowel. So weight is related to vowel quality, and in fact there are two cases. There are words that have at least one heavy, and there are words that have only light, light syllables. And how many possible combinations do we have here? Well, it's quite simple, because the stress can fall on the first or on the last heavy syllable in a word. Uh, in fact, we don't know of any language where stress would fall on the third heavy or something like that. So first or last, so count from the left or from the right, from the beginning or from the end. And first or last light vowel, if there are only light uh, vowels. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, two multiplied by two is four possible types of weight senses of stress, which is a very small number. Well, this is good. We started with 450 trillion, and we now have four. So, which is which means that we're we are very good at restricting ourselves, but well, this is now too few. So uh, there are some more possibilities that we need to describe. But the numbers where the numbers of possible stress placement types of weight sensitive stress will be something will be will be quite small. We are not going to deal with 150 trillion. Well, it's not going to be four only, but uh, a bit more, but still. So where does this a bit more come from? Let's look at at the Ossetian language. It is an Indo-European language, uh, an Iranian language, spoken in the south of the European part of Russia. And in this language, here are some examples uh, of words. Adjinag, Tsardistut, Nitsawin, Ustite, Efsin, Kabater, Quiroi, Tildim, Tatsal, Tastawin, Chizite. So you see that stress can only fall on the first two syllables of a word. We never see stress on the third syllable. And you see that it, in many cases, it falls on the first syllable of the word. So you see, Adjenak, Tsardistut, Nitsawin, Ustite. When does it not fall on the first syllable? When the first syllable contains a vowel like E or e, so this crossed I letter. Uh, if it is E or E, then stress falls on the second syllable of a word. Uh, and this is, a, this, is, this is basically the rule. Uh, stress the first syllable if it does not contain E or E, and stress the second syllable if the first syllable contains E or E. In the terms of heaven and light, what does it mean? E and E are obviously light. E, uh, this uh, crossed E. The non-crossed E is heavy. Uh, 
so A and E are light. They do not attract stress. And the remaining vowels are heavy. And uh, what can we say? That uh, if we look at a word like fast, sa, win, servant, the one before last, uh, you see that there are light, light, heavy, in fact. But in this word, the heavy syllable, uh, the syllable containing the e vowel falls outside the window that contains the first uh, that contains the first two uh, syllables. So stress can be placed only on the first or on the second syllable in a sentence. So there is a heavy vowel in the third syllable, but it doesn't play a role because it is outside of the window. Remember, we, s we said that in Portuguese this stress is restricted to the last three syllables. In a certain, it is the case is similar. Stress is restricted to the first or to the second uh, vowel or to the second syllable. And in this window, the rules for light and heavy operate. So uh, you take the first two syllables of a word. There, there you take the first heavy, if there is a heavy vowel, and you take the last light if there are only light vowels. So, for instance, in a word like ardistut. The first heavy is a, ah, so the stress in the first syllable. In a word like afsin, the first heavy is e, so stress in the second syllable. In a word like childim, uh, there are no heavies, the two vowels are light, so uh, stress the last light. And in a word like fast sawin, you look at the window of the stress window the first two syllables and you take the last light because both vowels are light and you ignore anything outside this window you ignore the heavy syllable win uh, which is uh, uh, which is there but it is outside of the window so what we can say here is that stress placement rules may operate in a stress window so which is most which most commonly contains two syllables and there are four types depending on stress and heavy heavy and light light because in heavy light and in light heavy, stress always falls on, on heavy, as we have already observed. If there is only, if there are, if there is at least one heavy, stress cannot fall on a light syllable. So four types, uh, heavy, heavy, light, light, uh, heavy, heavy. Uh, heavy, heavy, light, light, uh, and that's it. Uh, a well-known language of this kind is Latin. So in Latin, you have words like Domina, Dominica, Calefacere, Capitale. Uh, long vowels are marked by two um, by, a semicolon, by a semicolon made of triangles. Capitale, Benefice, Finitima, fini, Finitima. Well, I try to pronounce Latin, Latin vowel lengths uh, as they were in classical Latin. Maritale, Maritale, and Matutino. So four long vowels in the last word. And in Latin, the rule is. One thing is simple. The stress window is antepenult and penult, minus three and minus two. Stress the last heavy syllable and in this window, and the first light if there are only light syllables. Uh, so schematically, if we denote the last syllable by an X, because it is not important, it is outside the window, uh, you'll see that there are patterns like this. Heavy, heavy, X, stress the second, stress the penultimate syllable. Heavy, light, X, stress the antepenultimate syllable. Heavy, light, uh, light, heavy, X, stress the penultimate syllable. And light, light, X, stress the antepenultimate syllable, minus three. So uh, this is the rule as it can be formulated. If you have studied Latin, you, prob you probably learned this rule in another formulation. You probably learned it as stress the penultimate syllable if it is light and stress the third syllable from the end if the penultimate syllable uh, sorry stress the penultimate syllable if it is heavy and otherwise stress the antepenultimate syllable but uh, this is more or less the same uh, it is an equivalent formulation but this formulation with stress windows and uh, last heavy and first light allows to put latin into a broader typological perspective so that's how it works well now you see that there are stresses, uh, that there are stress windows, uh, and the rules that uh, allow us to uh, locate stress in a sequence of 
of heavy and light syllables. In Latin, there is one more complication to that. It is the fact that in Latin, uh, light and heavy, syllable, heavy syllables are not the ones having long vowels, but also the ones having co final consonants, closed syllables. But this does not need bother us here. Uh, so uh, syllable weight is um, a bit more a bit more complicated than uh, in Chuvash and Hasetian and Moksha, but still. Now we have a typology of stress windows. Uh, so most commonly stressed windows, the weight sensitive stress systems are the first two syllables, the last two syllables, or the antepenultimate syll syllable and the penultimate syllable. So one and two, minus two and minus one, and minus three and minus two. And uh, this makes it possible to return to combinatorics of stress placement. So we have five types of fixed stress. We have weight sensitive stress, stress first or last heavy, first or last light, in four possible ranges and four possible windows, all word, first two syllables, last two syllables, and antepenultimate and penultimate syllables. So which makes it a nice typology of five plus two multiplied by two multiplied by four, 21 types. So which is quite, an, uh, quite a good restriction placed upon the four, 450 trillion we had purely combinatorically. And that's how it can work. Well, it is not the whole truth, truth obviously. There are many more complications to stress systems in the languages of the world. If you look at these problems from the International Linguistics Olympiad, I tried to calculate how many cases would be solvable with this simple typology of light and heavy and uh, first light or last light, uh, first heavy or last heavy and stress windows. Well, it would be two problems would be definitely sol solvable with this typology and three problems it would be helpful but it is not the whole truth in two more problems you have some more complicated patterns so uh, it would account for approximately the half of the problems on stress at the international linguistics olympiad which is still something and that's what i was going to tell you today so thank you very much for your attention and I will be glad to take some questions if you have some, or I'm try I will go to try to answer them. Thank you. Hey there. Thank you, Piperski. Um... Alguém tem alguma pergunta para fazer para ele? A gente pode fazer sem medo. So I think if if you can if you ask me in Portuguese, so I uh, and someone translates into English, I can. That's how we can organize that. Uh, I'm gonna ask you. Hi, yeah, hello there. I'm Antonio. Hello. Uh, are there any general rules for uh, heavy and light syllables across languages or like across uh, language families? Uh, well, the most general rule is that uh, longer vowels tend to be tend to count as heavy. So long vowels in a language that has length distinction, long vowels are, count as heavy. Uh, short vowels count as short. And another uh, an, another rule is that uh, most typically, if we have syllable weight, then closed syllables syllables ending in a consonant have uh, are heavy and syllables uh, ending in a uh, in a vowel uh, open syllables are light so if you combine these two principles then the most uh, common way of uh, of dividing syllables into light and heavy is the latin one so is the one where you have heavy syllables either having a long vowel or being closed and light syllables having a short vowel and being open. So syllables like ta, ma with a short vowel are open, uh, open syllables with a short vowel and they are light. There are some more complications to that because for instance, in some languages, uh, it depends on the type of the final consonant. Uh, like uh, if you have got a sonorant there, a consonant like r, l or m or n, then uh, the syllable ending in a final consonant, uh, in, in, a fi in a sonorant, is more likely to be heavier than a syllable ending in a final obstruent. So, for instance, a syllable like tam is heavier, and a syllable like tat 
is light so that that's how it can be so but this is quite um, the latin pattern is probably the most widespread one okay okay and and what about like uh stress across words for example there are certain particles uh, that uh don't don't have stress naturally but uh it might be a syllable that in a word in a longer word it might be stressed you know yeah. um so yeah. it, uh, this is, how this does is, this work? Because it's a different word. Right? Yeah, this is uh, th this is an interesting case because different languages uh, um, use this uh, these different languages diff different languages treat these particles short function words quite differently. For instance, in English, uh, you see that uh, if you add an article to a to a sub if you add an article to a noun. Uh, and then it does not, it does not take stress. So if you say mm, function and you say a function or the function, you don't say the function or a function or something like that. In some other languages, it might not be the case. And for instance, in Russian, there are some function words that do take stress in some cases. For instance, prepositions. In Russian, you say ruku, uh, which means hand uh, in the accusative case. But if you add a preposition na on the hand, na plus ruku, it becomes naruku, naruku, with the stress in the first syllable, with the stress in the preposition, which is normally unaccented with many other words. So uh, languages differ in this respect as to whether function words can take stress or not. So in, in other words, we can say that in some languages, stress is assigned at the level of individual words and in this case uh so function words do not have stress and uh, content words do have stress and when you combine them the stress of the content word is retained and in other languages stress is assigned after words are combined into phrases so into so stress is assigned at the level of a phrase and this is the case in russian and in this in this case uh, you can have uh, stress on some unexpected short words. So that's, this is the main difference. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> thank you for the answer. Okay, so I was thinking about Portuguese and it doesn't end up with the 21 combinations. Mm. And as a nat native language, I, I don't remember the rules. I just know what to say. So I, I don't know if it, it, it would make sense the window of size three or mm -hmm. if it's another rule. Yeah, well, a window of size three does make sense because in Portuguese, you never have words that are accented on the fourth syllable from the end. Uh, but uh, the rest is it is quite complicated. Yes, there are uh, uh, there are languages where it is much more complicated than uh, what I have told you. And uh, your native language and my native language are the ones that do not fit into this typology because uh, uh, these in, in these languages. Well, if you want to have something like um, a complete description of uh, Portuguese stress, you need to take morphology into account. So you need to say that some words are lexically specified, that stress in some words uh, is lexically specified. So for instance, in nouns, you have to know whether it falls on the second syllable from the end or on the, four, or the, or on the third syllable from the end, or sometimes even on the last syllable. And uh, in verb in verbs you have to you have to take into account which uh, which form it is so tense uh, number person and so forth and actually such languages can also be described as languages having light lights and heavies or something like that because uh, if you look at uh, if, if 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 you look at a uh, if if you look at a Word, a word as consisting not of uh, syllables, but rather of individual morphemes, so roots, suffixes, prefixes, and so forth. You can ascribe these marks, heavy or light, to these morphemes. So they will be something, something imaginary that is not there at the surface level. So you don't have uh, 
so you don't pronounce these marks, but some of the endings would have heavy, some of the endings would have light, uh, and based on these combinations, you can compute stress even in Portuguese words. Well, obviously, if you know the history of Portuguese, you understand that Portuguese stress, stress originates from Latin stress. Uh, so in this case, if you, if you know that some endings originate from, uh, some suffixes originate from Latin, uh, from Latin uh, words with, uh, uh, from Latin suffixes with a long vowel and some other suffixes originate from Latin suffixes with a short vowel and so forth, and you combine this into a sequence of light and heavy morphemes, then you can compute stress. I am not aware of such studies for Portuguese, but for Russian, uh, uh, so the description was provided by a person that was already mentioned here and uh, today by Andrei Zelizniak, one of the originators of the uh, Linguistics Olympiads. He also was the person who described Russian stress in full detail. And he made a very complicated, uh, well, a quite, uh, a quite complicated from the first, uh, uh, a, a quite a complicated system of stress uh, patterns for old Russian uh, an even more complicated pattern system of stress patterns for pre for present Russian to describe what is going on. So let me show you just briefly. I'll show you a system. I'll show you an example of uh, of an old Russian text with uh, accents uh, as uh, anal as analyzed by Zelizniak. Just a moment. Let me find it. An example here. I don't have it quite at hand. Uh, just a moment. So, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, so let me show me show you the my screen. Uh, well, you see that uh, each morpheme, each uh, prefix or root or suffix has something like uh, an arrow, which is more or less heavy. Uh, but there are two types of heavies in Old Russian: uh, a downward arrow and a rightward arrow. And, or a minus, which is more or less light. And stress is determined as a by the combination of these arrows and uh, minuses. I'm not going into detail here, but you can describe a language like this also in terms of heavy and light. That's how it works. Um, I think I also have a question. Sorry. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned functions in your talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I would like to know how useful it is to use to see stress as a mathematical function, and because you also talked in terms of integers of negative numbers and etc. So I'd, I'd like to know if um, when stress gets more complicated, so I don't know, uh, do you use um, something different than integers to see it? I don't know. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it is. Uh really useful because uh, it is useful for a mathematically minded person because it puts uh, stress into a broader uh, context of uh, what is going on in different areas of life and uh, in mathematics. For a less mathematically minded person it's sufficient to say that well stress on the first syllable or stress on the second syllable or stress on the third syllable because uh, I, uh, I don't think that it is actually helpful to speak of it as a function for a general public because if you are if you are well acquainted with the notion of a function then it uh, rings a bell for you well it's more or less the same as in mathematics if you are not so well acquainted with the notion of a function then it is just an unnecessary complication that's what i think about it okay thank you So, so thank you very much for, for coming to South America. Thank uh, you very let, much. Let, let's hope that next time it will be in person one day. Yes. It's possible again. <laughs> There's okay. someone asking something in the chat. Yeah. Uh, let me have a look. Is there a language uh, that stresses not uh, what does it mean? Sorry. Ah, uh, if the stress is not only in one syllable, uh, ah. I, 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 yeah. 
the stress is not over. Yes, yes. So there are languages that have uh, primary stress and secondary stress, most commonly uh, on every second syllable counting from the stressed, stressed one, but not necessarily, or maybe on every third syllable counting from the stressed one. And there are also compound words, which we haven't talked about today uh, in many languages, where there are multiple stresses, for instance, uh, stronger stress on them, mm, stronger stress and uh, secondary stresses. So it is, uh, mm, it is quite possible that the, there are many stresses in a word, but uh, I have restricted myself to uh, the cases with one stress only at the beginning of the talk. So we were talking only about these cases. Secondary stress is quite an interesting problem too, because it can also follow quite complicated rules. Um, okay, thank you so much for doing your talk. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think most of us are really shy to <laughs> to actually open and uh, talk to you, but I am sure that everyone here enjoyed and really liked it. Thank you very much.